we're back in the words of uh, Jimmy Fallon on Saturday Night Live. It is another Froggy Wednesday on the Stripe Show podcast. And every week we have a guest. And you know what? It's like just every other week right here. We've got another great guest. We are joined by Australian Lucas Herbert. But you know what? Let me give you a proper introduction, Lucas. Two-time European t- uh, tour winner. The 2020 Omega Dubai Desert Classic. The 2021 Dubai Duty Free Irish Open. Ranked number 51 in the world, but the fourth highest Australian player, only behind Cam Smith, Adam Scott, and Mark Leishman. Uh, he's on social media. He's a good dude. I'll be honest with you. When I reached out to him to ask him to do the podcast, he said, yeah, I'll come on as long as you don't ask any boring questions. So I promise we won't have any boring questions, Lucas. <laughs> How are you? Froggy, thanks for having me on. I'm good. How are you? I'm doing really well, man. You know, it's it, it, to, to somebody like me who is, I'm just a huge golf fan. I play golf. I suck at it. Um, but I mean, I, I love to watch golf. I'm very deep into it. And so you're one of the new guys. You got your tour card going to Corn Ferry Tour, playing on the PGA Tour. To me, when somebody, when I, when they hold up that card and it says, I got my PGA Tour card, to me, it means you can play wherever the hell you want. But I guess it really doesn't work that way, right? Yeah, not quite. I mean, uh, it's almost like you get the PGA Tour card benefits, so you can go to the TPC courses and practice, and you can you can say you're a PGA Tour player. But yeah, as far as as far as being able to pick whatever events you want to play in, you're probably still quite a ways away off that. So uh, that's all right. It's I mean, it's definitely closer to um, playing all the events that I've watched growing up on TV, and right, and the you know the big events that you want to play in. Um, like your Rivieras and your Arnold Palmers and memorials and, and everything like that. Uh, you, you're definitely one step closer than I was last year. However, uh, yeah, we're not quite there yet, but um, it, it's still pretty cool to see that that card with your name in, in, uh, engraved on it. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be cool because that had to be a dream at one time. Like, hey, I, you, know, you, you start playing golf, you play at a competitive level, you know you're pretty good. But to really get to that top level, the top of the mountain is to get your PGA Tour card. So that had to be a a dream and, and now what you can, you can call an accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, it all, yeah. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not even sure that it has quite sunk in yet. It's, it's still quite a strange feeling. I mean, the, the years that I've had to go through to get both onto the European tour and then to this year to get onto the PGA tour, just with the schedules that I've played and, and how I've had to perform um, really, really well at the exact right times. It's just, it would make me nervous if I had to go and do them again. They're, right. uh, they, were, they were tough, tricky years. And, and so to get through them and, and to be on the PGA Tour, it was like, it's pretty satisfying. Now, our podcast is brought to you by uh, Encore Golf and Encore Design High Performance Golf Balls for all players, all skill levels, all swing speeds. So get fitted for your perfect golf ball right now at EncoreGolf.com. Lucas, when you, you, you've played on the European Tour, you've played on the Corn Ferry Tour, now you've played on the PGA Tour. What's the biggest difference between the three tours? Um, there's a lot of little different things that um, it's really interesting that, that kind of change around. It, and it's funny, the first couple of events of the season on the PGA Tour here, uh, I know it's early in the season, so obviously like no one's really stressed about keeping that tour card or um, you know they're, they're not worried about getting enough money up to the end of the season. But it's probably felt the most chilled out and the most stress-free environment almost out here on the PGA Tour compared to any of the others. Just because like, I mean, the jump from those, both those tours up to the PGA Tour in terms of how much money you're making, um, it's pretty incredible. And it's now not really so much of making money to, to, um, to keep yourself afloat, to put food on the table, to, you know, to pay off mortgages, anything like that. It's almost like, you know, if you've got any sort of decent agent, you're probably going to sign contracts for, you know, for enough money that you need at the start of the year. So all of a sudden, everyone just wants to play well, to play well. They just want to, they just want to be in contention and, and compete. And um, it's now not that, that sort of driving like, oh, I have, to, I have to play well here to keep my tour card to, you know, to put food on the table for my family and all that kind of thing, which I, I think it can be uh, definitely on the Corn Ferry Tour and, and it can be on the European Tour as well. So. I mean, that's a difference. Obviously, the golf courses are another standard up here on the PGA Tour, and um, they're going to test your game um, a lot more than they do on the other tours. And the, the depth of fields as well. I mean, um, 
it, it just it feels like you can't kind of scrap it around and and just shoot you know just squeeze out a, an, an even par or one under and make the cut like obviously last week here at sanderson farms the cut was five under par so you know you can shoot two pretty nice rounds of two under and you know you might not have played that badly it's just maybe some putts didn't drop and all of a sudden like you're packing your bags heading over for the weekend so right um, yeah it's a tough school out here yeah, I know as you've started the season at the Fortinet and also at the Sanderson two missed cuts, is your game not where you want it to be? Or is or is there a case of some nerves going on because it is a new place? And are you a little starstruck ever out there when you see somebody who you've been like, hey, I've, wa- I've grown up watching this guy, now I'm playing with him? Um, no, I, my game's not nowhere near where I want it to be right now. I've just really struggled. I'm trying to get my coach out from Australia, which is a, uh, a challenge in itself with all the border restrictions and whatnot going on now. But um, I've sort of run into a bit of a problem the last four weeks um, that I've not really dealt with before. So, I mean, for, for us out here on tour, generally, like, most guys are probably going to have one, two, maybe three things that, like, generally everything that goes wrong in a swing comes from, from those one or two or three issues. So you kind of go back to the root of the problem. You fix one, you fix whatever that might be. Um and generally that's going to get you on your way pretty quickly. But this is just something that I really haven't run into before. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been difficult to kind of, yeah, to get it around the course. I mean, obviously, even though the scores have been low, the, the golf courses haven't necessarily been really forgiving. So, um, yeah, I've just been punished for not playing well, which is what it should be out here on tour. And um, it's obviously frustrating to start this way. Like, I would have liked to have gotten off to a nice start and, and been, you know, pretty stress-free over Christmas, re-ranking in my category up nicely and, and knowing that I can play a few events early next season. But uh, I still got a chance to do that at Bermuda and, uh, and Mayakoba. Um, so it's not all is lost by the first two cuts being missed. But yeah, definitely definitely would have liked to have started a little bit better than I have. Um, but yeah, we'll be, we'll be fine. Have you had that starstruck moment yet where you've been around somebody or been paired with somebody and you're like, holy shit. Like I watched this guy on TV, or I've been a fan, and then now here I am playing with him. Been a few guys. I mean, I played with Camilo Vijegas at the uh, at the second Corn Ferry Finals event, and that was interesting. I like Camilo came to Australia, and I remember watching him. I'd have been fourteen years old watching right. him play the Australian Masters, and at that time he he did the like the signature like Spider Man kind of putt read, and yeah, um, you know he was just the coolest guy in golf. And I remember watching him, and I was like. So just yeah, I was pretty starstruck then, and then yeah, I got I got paired with him. I think third or fourth round in in Columbus, and um, I mean that was really cool as well. Like I just said to him, hey, like you remember coming out to Australia? Like yeah, I was I was there watching you, and like yeah, I thought you were the coolest thing ever. Um, who else have we played with? I, like, to be fair, I think we've been paired with most most weeks. We've been paired with guys that are in my category. Um, so straight out of Corn Ferry finals as well, but even just getting around. Um, you know, like the putting green or the range or whatever. It's like, I've actually been really blown away with how many guys know who I am. You know, I just expected to be coming in from a different tour and, you know, I'm just another rookie and these guys have no idea who I am. And um, There's just guys that, yeah, you just watch on TV all the time that are, you know, hey man, nice playing at Corn Ferry Finals. Like, um, congrats on getting your tour card. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. Like, that, that's been a really cool moment so far is like all these guys just, yeah, like, knowing who I am and just showing me a little bit of respect. That is cool. I mean, you've got two wins. I know you uh, you won the, the very first time you won. Now, that trophy was giant. I, I have to ask, where the hell did you put that giant trophy at? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, when I first picked it up, um, when they did the presentations, like, they're obviously about to take photos. And I, I picked it up, and straight away I've gone, oh, I'll get your photos really quick. This is so heavy. Like, I'm not going to be out to hold this in very long. So, um I think, I mean, I took like, I took a million photos of it that night. And then basically as soon as we, I think as soon as I went to do like a press conference, that was the last time I saw it until the, um, until we played the event this year. Like I got a replica one sent to my house, which was oh. only, the replica was only maybe like, like that big, like, oh, okay. uh, like a 40 centimeter kind of replica. But okay. yeah, I would have been, it would have been interesting to try and get that thing home on the plane. Like, I don't know how I would have done it. Yeah, because my next question was, did I know you said you, you turned up a little bit with some scotch that night. I was wondering if you poured it in that and then drank out of that, because that seems to be the things to do with the Claret Jug and other trophies. Yeah, I would have loved to. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I wasn't sure. 
I, to be honest, I didn't even look at the big trophy as to whether you could drink out of it. The Scotch story was um, at my 21st birthday, probably like about 10 of my friends pitched in and, and bought like a really nice bottle of Scotch for me. And mm-hmm. the, the note they left on it was like, you can open this when you win your first tournament. So that was like, that was, the fir- that was basically the first tournament I won as a pro. I uh, hadn't won anything at like lower levels down the Australian tour or anything like that. So um, yeah, that was the first tournament that I won. So that was like the first thing that came to my mind. It was like, all right, guys, we've got to drink this scotch together. So once I got back home, it was like I did this grand tour with a bottle of scotch. Like everyone who uh, pitched in for it, I was like, right, come on, we've got to have a drink. <laughs> That's awesome. See, that's good. So you celebrated with your buddies. Yeah, yeah. We had some very good celebrations in that first thing. You know, you, you mentioned that you've seen some guys on tour that are coming up to you congratulating you on getting your tour card, and you're surprised they know who you are. Sean Foley, who, as you know, is a big-time PGA Tour coach. He's coached Justin Rose, uh, Hunter Mahan, Tiger Woods. He's got lots of good guys in his. I think he's got Cameron Champ now in his stable. Um, he's quote is saying that you will be as good as you want to be. What does that mean to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, Foles is uh, – so I've, I've got a place in Arworth. Well, I've I got a place and practice at Arworth in, in Orlando, and um, Foles is there. He works with a bunch of his guys there, so we, we see him around a fair bit, and um, you know, it's pretty common that we'll go play practice rounds with other guys that he's playing with, or like, you know, you, you just see him around there a lot. So had a fair bit to do with Foles. You obviously see him out of tournaments as well. So, um, yeah, I, I don't remember where it was. I know my coach, Dom, was over early in the year and he heard it. Um, Foles basically said, yeah, like, this kid can be as good as he wants to be. And I, I guess, like, golf's a, golf's a tricky one with... Um, everyone, I guess as a kid, everyone wants to be number one in the world or most kids want to be number one in the world or they want to win majors or everything like that. And then once you start getting older and, and definitely like once you start making money out of the game, um, you can start living a lifestyle that's pretty comfortable um, and not be the number one player in the world. Like you can be, you can probably be about a hundredth in the world and, and live quite a comfortable lifestyle. Um, and it, it can be difficult to get motivated to go and play, you know, better or, um, or to work that extra bit harder um, when you when you are comfortable and you're content. So, yeah, I guess that comment is basically, um, you know, if I wanted to take Tiger's work ethic and, um, you know, train really hard and, and dedicate my entire life to, to golf, then, yeah, I could probably get to number one in the world. But, you know, that's not what I want to do. And I want to, you know, live a comfortable life. I could very easily be at not, at probably 100 in the world and, like, you know, I guess my talent's not capped at, at a certain level, you know, you, um, I, I can't even, I don't even want to name guys to be honest, but there's definitely guys you've seen over the year that might have been one hit wonders that have won tournaments and you're like, where the hell did they come from? And then you never really hear from them again. Like, I mean, that was, that was the, that was the cap on their talent. They were never going to be number one players in the world. They were never going to probably be top 10 players in the world, but um, they got the most out of their game possible. Um, and yeah, I guess that comment's probably aimed at like, you know, I can, yeah, I can get as good as, as I really want to be. I've got probably a lot of X factor and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of the right things going for me that, uh, you know, if I can sharpen, sharpen the things that I'm not good at, then I can make myself into a pretty good player. So, with that being said, how good does Lucas want to be? What, what is your ceiling that you see for yourself? Um, it's tricky. I don't really know right now. I mean, it, it seems like to me, I kind of, I dip my toes in the water a little bit um further and and see whether i like it or not and then that kind of then then that's like a a bit of a yardstick as to where i where i go next to them i mean um i'd gotten to i think i got into 64 in the world uh when covid shut down everything and and whatnot and um i sort of felt comfortable there and then you know i hadn't gotten any better than that from a world ranking perspective until july this year and then all of a sudden I go and win Ireland, I finish fourth in Scotland and I get into the top 50 in the world. And that was like from 64 to 50, that was a, that's a big jump. Yeah. Even though it doesn't really sound like that much, like that, that, that's quite a big jump. So like, um, it's, I, I almost, yeah, I'm not sure. Like if, if you, if I win the next two tournaments in a row and get to 20th in the world, like would I actually feel comfortable there? Like I'm not, I'm not too sure. So um, I'm, it, it seems like the way I kind of go is like I dip my toes in the water and I, you know, I, I see where I see where I'm at. Um, I see where I can get to and like, you know, maybe take stock in that for a little while. And then, you know, you sit on that for a little bit and go like, you know what, I can be better than this. And that kind of, you end up sort of just on this path of like getting better that way. 
kind of almost a slow way. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not a Colin Morikawa who's going to come out two years after turning pro and be top five in the world. Um, and why is great. that? Um, I don't know. It's just it's just how it's just how my brain works and how my personality works and everything like that. Um, and you know, I'm I'm definitely someone that likes to keep a good um, work life balance. I, I want to right. enjoy everything. You know, I'm, I'm pretty fortunate. I'm a 25 year old guy who's making very good money playing golf every day for a living, traveling the world. Like right. there's very few people that get to do that. And like, I, I, I guess I don't want to get to, you know, 50 or 60 years old and, and look back and think like, wow, like I had that. And all I wanted to do was go to the range and get better. Like I want to, you know, there's a part of me that wants to enjoy life as a 25 year old a, a little bit at times. And obviously it's, it's a balance, but getting that balance right and then still um, being hungry to play good golf is, is just tricky. And, um, yeah, it's probably the reason my results have come out the way they have. Yeah, I mean, all the money in the world can buy you back time. So you're exactly right. Where you, you, know, you enjoy it now, enjoy it while you can, still be young, still get to do – but at the same time, see the world, play golf, make money. 100%. But enjoy yourself and not overgrind. Yeah, 100%. Is there any part of this game that comes easy to you? Because we know it's not an easy game. And we know that, you know, one day your driving's great, your arm play's not great, or you're putting well and other things are off. Is there any part of golf that just kind of comes naturally and easy to you? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, running through my head on, you know, all the parts of my game, like I've worked really hard on all parts of my game at different parts of my career. So, um I would say like I've probably always had really good hands with my short game, um, being able to have really soft hands while still kind of accelerating the club. And that's probably just something that you can't teach. Um, it's, it's really hard to teach that. That's probably the only thing I feel like I was kind of handed a little bit. Everything else, like I've, I've worked really hard at, at various points in my career on, um, you know, if you... The more, I think the more you look on tour, like there's not really a bad Australian bunker player. We're all kind of really good at uh, at being um, sort of wizards out of the bunker. But I think that's come about from like the courses we've grown up on back in Australia are all quite different sand to here. So we've had to have really good techniques to be able to play them well there. And then we come over here and it's, it's probably a lot easier. Um, right. But yeah, like every, everything takes a lot of work. I mean, it's sort of one of those things like it, when I'm playing well, like it looks so easy, but I can promise you it's not. Like no. it's just a lot of work you know, on the weeks where you don't see us on TV, like there's a lot of work being put in in those weeks to make it look so easy when we are on TV. Yeah, I always say that, like when you watch like somebody like Freddie Couples or even in the new age, you watch somebody like Dustin Johnson. When Dustin's hitting it good and playing well, it looks like the most effortless, easy, just like anybody could do it. But we know playing the game that that's not the case. And I think that that's when you're really playing so well is when it really does look easy and it looks effortless. Yeah, I mean, uh, Dustin's a great example because people think he doesn't really practice that much. He, you know, he just loves to work out and and go play with his buddies. But I can, like, I mean, if he was if he was this good when he turned pro, he would have been doing the things that he's doing right now when he turned pro. And like, he never struggled when he turned pro, but he definitely wasn't, you know, winning majors. And you know, he won he won the BMW champs last year by eleven shots. Like he he never did that when he turned pro. I can, I can promise you that guy works so freaking hard on his game um you know i've heard stories about like he got really good with his wedge play because uh you seeing i think he was, was he seeing butch or claude i can't remember one of the Harmons. um mm -hmm. and they said all right dj i want you to go home and i don't want you to hit a shot above like a hundred 125 yards or 100 yards maybe just i just want you to work on your pitching for ages like you know just work really really hard on your pitching and like I, I, ever, TJ gets a rap for being dumb and like it's kind of he, he's not he's 100 not dumb but this is like this is like an example he go he goes away with that and just works really really hard on his pitching right gives Claude a call or Butch one of the Harmons um, gives him a call six months later and he's like hey can I start hitting shots over 125 yards now like six months later not like two days later like six months later for six months he hasn't hit a shot in practice over 125 yards that the guys just grinded on them. So, um, wow. There's the, every player would have stories like that where they've spent hours and hours and hours on the range. And like, 
you know, like you take, uh, occasionally I'll like take photos of divot patterns because I'm like, there's no way anyone will believe that I've just done that in one session. Like that's, you know, I've just taken up half the range, but then every player on tour would have done that at some point. So it's, you know, I don't feel too, too different doing that. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't think people realize how hard any of these guys work to make their game what it is. We only see Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday on television. You don't see social media has given us maybe a little bit of a glimpse into how hard they're working. The coaches are posting the players post sometimes, but there obviously is, is a lot of work. And, you know, looking at your stats right now on the European tour, you were first in uh, putts per green and regulation and first in average putts per round. Obviously that doesn't come from just by chance. So your putting must be something that you put a lot of time and effort and energy into that you've seen then pay off on the greens. Yeah, I think I understand my putting quite well in terms of what I need to do to putt well. Uh, I've got pretty good solid foundations that my coach and I have worked on for, you know, probably 10 years now. Very, very similar kind of patterns. Um, similar, like, you know, the putter that I use is, is very, very similar um, to what I've used. Like, I've always used face balance kind of weighted putters. Um, I've changed grip once in that time. Uh, and then I'm just very consistent with what I do. I've got a, I'd, I'd say like a putting station, basically of, that consists of like one technique drill and then three um, sort of like games that I play pretty much each day uh, when right. I go to practice. And that, and they, you know, that'll take anywhere between 60 to 90 minutes every time I go to practice. Wow. And then if I feel like I haven't been doing a lot of work on my putting, like I, I can stand there. I can stand there and feel like I get quality work done and putt for three or four hours. Um, wow. I've got like I've got no no qualms doing that um, because to me it just feels like when I get out on the golf course on a to- in a tournament day, like I just want to pick a spot of like okay, I'm hitting it there, and I just hit it there. Like I'm not worried about how I do that. It's just all reaction and it's all feel, you know, just to hit it. I'm, I'm as Tiger says, like putting to a picture, like. That's kind of all I do. So if I can get all the fundamentals so drilled in that I never have to worry about, oh, don't pull it or push it, then like I can be so freed up on the golf course to hit the parts exactly how I want to. Um, and I, yeah, I guess like I've got some sort of, I'm probably different in the way I, I view concepts. Like um, definitely with like the speed of putting, I, I see this, I see this, um, you know, like getting your speed right on the greens. I see that so differently to other, to the way other people do. Um, and I'm going to sound like Bryson DeChambeau by trying to explain that. So you, you can make the call on whether you want to hear that theory or not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, go ahead. No, and I also want to ask you about your grip change as well. Um, so everyone looks at speed, like your you speed of putting as um, how far past the hole that the ball goes. Right. So everyone's quite different in that, you know, some people want it to go six inches past the hole. Some people want it a foot and a half, some people want it two feet, some people want it three feet. Like everyone's quite different, which is which is fine. It's you know, it's not a there's not a perfect number. But right. I ask people then why do they pick that speed? Is it based off how long do you want the next part to be if you do miss the hole? Or are you about optimizing the mo like if you hit it three feet past the hole, if it hits the edge of the hole, it's gonna lip out. But if you're hitting it at dying speed on the hole, it's gonna fall in from the edge. Like that that sort of makes sense, right? Right. So, so to me, I pick my like I pick the speed that I try and hit the ball into the hole based on giving myself the most chance for the ball to go in. So if you look at if you look at the speed that the ball is going at the hole in a measurement of like miles per hour or feet per second or however you want to measure speed versus how far past the ball goes, then I think that's a more accurate representation of your speed. So like downhill parts sometimes like you might hit a part that's at really good speed that'll go five feet past the hole right which is fine because the actual speed of the ball at the hole is really solid and it will go in a, from a lot of points on that hole whereas like uphill you might hit it on slow greens uphill you might hit it a foot and a half past the hole and that's actually gone too fast at the hole because if it hits the edge of the hole it's going to lip out because the wow. greens are so slow because you're going uphill you might be into the grain like so i look at Putting, I look at the speed as like almost a measurement, like, you know, like you've got a radar gun there measuring how fast the ball is rolling at the hole versus getting a representation of that by how far past the hole the ball goes. So do so, you want like, the ball to just tremble over the edge when you putt or do you want it to hit the back of the hole? 
Um, so I kind of like, if you imagine like where the back of the hole comes down and then it kind of goes on an angle to where like it collects at the bottom for the pin. Mm-hmm. I like to almost see it half volley where it comes down the back of the hole and that bottom, that bottom section, if you, if you imagine like that kind of. Right. That so it's going to hit there. That's where it's going to hit. I like a little half volley in there. So whatever speed that needs, like that to me is like really good holding speed from a, you're not going to get a lot of bobbles around the hole where the ball's going to, you know, hit a spike mark or, or whatever and just veer offline. It's going to hold its speed well enough to kind of catch the hole, but also like it's going to use as much of the hole as possible and like lip-ins are going to lip in more for you than they lip out. Does that, does that sort of all make sense? I don't know. Whether yeah. I'm, yeah, no, yeah. it does. I mean, because that's the thing is that you, you see the ball going into the hole a little differently than, than some people do. And that's why I asked, do you want it to just tremble over the edge and fall? Yeah. Or do you, you know, some people want it to ram the back of the cup. I see some, some pros uh, when they putt from two or three feet, it literally slams the back of the hole. And I'm like, well, I know that's what they want, but if that puts a little bit off center, it's going to lip out. So that's why I'd ask you, well, how do you see the ball going in? Yeah, correct. I think like, I, I mean, my stats from, from three to five feet are generally the ones that pretty much are like a big X factor for me. And they're, they're generally pretty high up. I don't really, I think to a average is like 83%. And I don't think I've ever really been at to an average from three to five feet. I've always been around 90%. That's and for good. me, that's always been something that's like, it's a speed thing. So if I get like, if I get over a four footer and I'm just not a hundred percent sure on the line, like I'll hit it softer than I, than before I'll hit it harder. Because to me, it's like if I hit it softer, I've got more of the hole to use. And right. generally, if, if you're struggling to read a putt from four feet, it's probably not going to break a hell of a lot. So if you hit it pretty soft at the middle of the hole from four feet, it's going gonna, it's gonna to find a way to get in, whether it lips in or you know whether it is just straight. But I see a lot of people from that range, like especially amateurs, will just try and jam it at the back of the hole. Right. And you'd want to be, you'd want to be pretty damn good to be able to get that thing to hit center of the cup or else it's going to lip out on you. Right, exactly. Now, when you made a grip change, what did you change from and to? Yeah, so I was always, um, I was always like a, like a conventional. I'm not sure which way the camera's going to show it, but yeah, like, like a reverse overlap kind of. Yeah, I was always like conventional, like right hand low with like yeah, pretty much pretty similar to Brooks's grip actually, with the with the finger down the back of the shaft. Okay. Um, I always did that since I was a kid, and then uh, I was working on some stuff with the coach um, around like I was kind of coming up with the with the lead elbow. So he goes, just like, just go cross hand grip with that lead arm really straight. And then that way it's got to keep the club kind of low. So left hand low. Yeah. So a left hand low grip. And it, it started off as a drill. And then I was putting with it. And I was like, I actually, this is actually really good. I'm, I'm just going to switch and do this all the time. So that's how it turned out to be a, a left hand low grip for me. Um, and that's pretty much like the only thing I've really changed in my putting. I, I change putt like I rarely change putters. Um, I've had yeah, it's so putt- strange to me. Sometimes I'll see like DJ for example. He'll change putters in the middle of a, in the middle of a of, a, yeah. of a tournament. Like play one one day, play this, and another play play another putter. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like, but he's so good. His putting stats are always pretty much unbelievable. So you can't knock really like that that strategy. But I know for me, like, um, I'm just so confident. I, I know how the putter swings with with the putter I have. I just know. I know exactly what to do with it. I, it's just, it's so good for me. It's just consistency. And that's why I'm probably consistency consistently like gaining strokes on the field putting. I'll have an off day here or there, but yeah, generally I, I don't tend to lose a lot of strokes putting to the field. Um, the, the, the weird one I do is I, I carry two putters with me to a tournament. One's like slightly, slightly sort of toe weighted. Um, and then one's like a face balance. So ju- the weighting's slightly different. In the practice rounds, I'll use the one that's a little bit more like toe weighted um, because it, to me, it feels like it helps me release the putter head a little bit just with some practice strokes. And then I do a little bit of practice with it on the on the putting green and then um, go to my gamer. So it's like, a, it's a bit of a strange one that people are always like baffled by, but yeah, it's just something I've, I've quite enjoyed. Um, just feeling like I can release the putter head a little bit more and then I don't have to feel like I do it so much with a face balance putter. Right. As far as your, as far as distance goes, the, you know, there's been so much talk around distance lately with Bryson and the long drive guys and so many guys hitting it further on tour and the dialing back the ball and the equipment and all, all the talk that goes on. Has distance been a focus of yours? I see that in 2020, your average uh, off the tee was 301 and in 2021, it was a little over 312. So was that an intentional gain? Was that something you worked on or did they, or were you just driving it straighter and getting more credit for your distance? 
Yeah, we probably had a combination of a couple of things. Um, I mean, through through that lockdown period with COVID, uh, I was going pretty hard in the gym. I didn't really talk too much about it because I saw Bryson come out of lockdown and basically <laughs> made me look like some sort of chump. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought I was training really hard and then I saw what he did and I'm like, oh my God, I've done nothing. Uh, <laughs> so, that was, I mean, that would have helped a little bit, but then, yeah, we, we, we tinkered around with driver setups as well. So I'd always played a 44, 44 and three quarter inch driver, I think. And we actually got up, we actually went to a 47 inch for a little while. Um, but probably found 47 was too too long to control, so we're back at a 46 um, inch driver. So that's definitely helped a lot. I've been able to um, get a lot more distance out of that without without really doing a lot to change technique or anything like that. Um, and that was obviously a Bryson effect too. He he did that, and and I think everyone at the time sort of went, well, should we test driver shafts as well? Um, right. You know, the guy was just doing doing things that made everyone else look around and be like, right, we probably need to do something about this as well. So, um, yeah, that was definitely, that was definitely something that I, that we, you know, we looked at from a, um, from a technique, oh, not from a technique, from a, um, a technology setup, I guess, with, with the equipment and whatnot. So, uh, yeah, that's, I think that would probably be the biggest uh, reason for that distance gain. Are you comfortable where you are now on your distance or are you still looking for more? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's probably there's probably five or six guys on tour that I'm just like, you know what, I can't hit it as far as them, um, and that's fine. I think anyone past there, it's like I will probably keep up with them on a good day, and they might be turning right. in front of me on a on a day where I'm not driving it as well. Um, you know, like whether it might be into the wind, you str- I, I struggle a little bit more than you know than them, or downwind, I might be better than they are, and it kind of just levels itself out at the end of the day, but. Um, I, yeah, I don't feel like I need to hit the ball any further um, to keep up with the current crop of guys. But, I mean, it seems like over the last 20 years, it, the guys who were the longest in the early 2000s are now the ones that are at the back of the field. Um, and they're probably driving it as far as they did 15, 20 years ago. So I'm sure there'll be a point where I do need to get more distance than I'm currently, uh, currently hitting it. But, yeah, for the moment, it's probably not the biggest focus for me. Now, I notice you're wearing the uh, the Whoop bracelet. How much does that go into you, whether it's recovery or whether it's what, – what have you changed as far as getting your body ready to play each week? Uh, it's definitely really interesting just to keep an eye on trends with it, what seems to affect your recovery, what, what doesn't. Um, even like, you know, you might get – you might get a day where, you know, you, you get a rain delay and it washes out and, you know, you, you really – you don't get a chance to get to bed till 10 p.m. and then – because of the rain delay, you're up on the course at 6.30 the next day. So you're up at, you know, you might be up at four o'clock. So you could be getting, you could be getting sort of four or five hours sleep, which is definitely not ideal prior to a tournament round. But if you can look at the whoop data and it's like, actually, you know what? You did get, you did only get four and a half hours sleep, but they're actually really good hours of sleep. So you're actually not as bad as what you think you are. Mm-hmm. That- that can be beneficial or there's been times where I've slept in and had 10 hours sleep and it's still like, no, you, you know, you're only at 30% recovery to me. They can be really helpful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to behave differently those days where I'm at 25, 30% to when I'm at 75, 80%. Um, cause I just don't have, you know, at 30%, I just don't have the energy that I, that I normally would. So I'm probably going to react a whole lot less to hitting bad shots because it's just, you know, if you hit a bad shot and you react to it, it's like hitting another shot as far as an energy standpoint goes and you just don't have those energy reserves or you're probably going to try and eat a lot more than you normally would. You're going to drink a hell of a lot of water. Um, you might walk slower between shots. Like a lot of that kind of data has been really interesting. And then even, you know, even in off weeks, I, when I first got whoop, I noticed that like I didn't drink anywhere near enough water in off weeks. Um, and... I, it was nearly at the point like I might go home for four weeks and actually never recover from that tournament stretch that I just come home from because like I never actually gave myself a chance to recover. So yeah, there was a lot of data that I got out of it that I was like, that's super interesting. And it's, and it's, um, I think it's helped me a lot in the last couple of years since starting to wear it. Right. Uh, it would be very dumb of me to have you on the podcast and not talk about what happened in Columbus. And we don't have to mention <laughs> what state, that Columbus was in, but if you're not aware, Lucas was, uh, was playing in the Boise open 
and Al- Albertson's Poise Open and uh, and uh, got his card and had to be in Columbus. Well, there are multiple Columbuses across the country. You could be in Columbus, Georgia, or you could be in Columbus, Ohio. Can you go over that story? How did it happen? And when did you realize you were in the wrong spot? Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I, I still find it hilarious. Um, <laughs> a few people have like tried to really pay me out for it. And I'm like, I think it's hilarious. Like, it is. you travel as much as we do, it's bound to happen at some point, especially in America, too. Like, I mean, you got from a culture standpoint, you guys had no culture when it came to naming places. Like, <laughs> it was like you've just got a you just got a list of town names that you've just applied to every single state. It's like there's 417 Springfields in America. So good right. luck trying to fly to one of them. But um, yeah, we I don't know I don't even know when I booked my flight, but I had I've got my myself and my my trainer, my physio um, with me, and then my caddy as well. So I booked my flight and my trainer's flight from Boise to Columbus, Georgia, it turns out. I uh, didn't really look, obviously, enough. And then I've, I've sent that flight information to my caddy and gone like, hey, here's the flight that we're on, like, if you want to be on the same flight for, you know, just for getting to the airport with rental cars and everything like that, like, you know, right. here's what we're going to be on. So not only did I get it wrong, like, he's then gone and booked the same flight. Um, so we had two of us sort of go over it and check and still get it wrong. So... I mean, it was just it was just a funny day. Like, we were staying with Curtis Lark, another Aussie, and he was like, what flight are you guys on? Obviously, both going to the same event. And we're like, um, oh, yeah, we're on uh, – we're going to Dallas, and then Dallas to Columbus uh, gets in at 8.30 or something. And he's like, oh, okay. And he, I think he said later, he's like, I never saw that flight on the itinerary, but, you know, maybe it was like – maybe it was booked out when he tried to book flights or whatever. Right. So, yeah, we fly – we put, fly – get on the plane in Boise. We fly to Dallas. Um, I mean, at this point, I probably don't even realize there's more than one Columbus that you can even fly to. So it's not <laughs> as if I'm really, uh, it's not as if I'm really sharp looking for the right one anyway. But yeah, we went like, we were floating around the airport and then we got on the plane. Like none of us, I mean, when you travel sort of a lot, like we're not sitting around listening to airport announcements. Right. We're, right. Where's the gate? We'll go sit in front of that with headphones on. And then you, your ticket just says Columbus. Doesn't you, I don't? Know, it probably says Georgia, but we're not looking for that. So we walked on the plane, scanned our ticket. You know, we've all got headphones on, so we've we've taken off. And like, I'm thinking like Dallas to Columbus. That's got to be like, that's got to be like a two and a half hour, three flight, a three hour flight, like just at a guess. And I get on the plane, and I think I went to connect to the Wi-Fi, and it was like, oh, you've only got an hour and twenty till you land. And I'm like, oh. How good's that? Like, I thought this was going to be a long flight. It's only a short one. Uh, right. In. And then, like, and looking back, like, the plane was pretty small as well, and there's not a lot of people on it. So we're thinking, like, that's, that's kind of, like, that was probably an alarm bell, but I didn't, I mean, you don't expect to have booked to the wrong place. So, like, that's weird that there's not a lot of people on this flight. And then, so we've landed at the airport. We've gotten off the plane. We've walked through, and we're like, I mean, we played Memorial, so we've been to Columbus Airport before. We're walking to the airport, we're like, Huh, we must be at a different terminal. Like, I don't know. This is, not, <laughs> this is not the airport that we remember. So we walk through. We get all our bags off the belt. I've got, like, I'm preferred with Avis. So, like, I can go. It t- like, it tells me what spot my car's in. I don't right. need to, I, like, I don't need to go to the desk. But right. there's a desk there, so I go there anyway. I'm not even sure why I did this. But I go to the desk. And I'm like, hey, um, I've got a car. It's in this spot. Like, am I right to go? And they're like, we don't really do spots here. You know, like, we don't leave the keys in the car. So already I'm like, okay, that's weird. So she's like, do you have, like, I give her my credit card license. She can't find anything on the booking. So she's like, do you have a booking number? And I'm like, yeah, I do. So I give her that. And it's about at this point that I'm like, oh no, like, what have I done here? So she goes away with the booking number and I'm thinking like, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Chicago, right? So Chicago's got O'Hare and Midway airports that you can fly in both commercially. So I'm thinking right. like, maybe Columbus has got two airports. Maybe there's like, there's the big international one that everyone flies into and we've just flown into like a regional airport or something. It's, you know, so I'm thinking like, oh yeah, we, you know, we might have to get an Uber or something to right. um, to the other airport. So I pull like, I look at where the car booking's from and I, it's like, uh, what's the Columbus airport called? It's like John Wayne airport or something like that. Yeah. So I search that on Google maps. And so like it comes up and I scroll out a little bit and I'm like, okay, the blue dot's not here. All right, where, how far away is this blue dot? And I'm like scrolling out, I'm like pinching the screen. And I'm like, oh no, 
<laughs> oh, no. And then, like, I scroll out far enough and I see the blue dots just miles down south. And I'm like, oh, it hasn't updated our, our location from Dallas. And then I had another look and I'm like, oh, hang on. No, like, we're not in Dallas either. And that was when it was like, oh, no. And it was just like, I walked over to the boys and I'm like, they still hadn't realised. I walked over to the boys and I'm like, hey, fellas, do you want to hear about possibly the dumbest thing that we've ever done in our lives? And we sat there... We sat there for 15 minutes just laughing, just laughing at ourselves, like how stupid we were. But we didn't really do anything in terms of, like the airport shut behind us. You know, we walked out the door and they, sh- they locked the doors behind us because it's such a small airport. Right. So like, we just laughed for 15, 20 minutes. I was calling like, I was calling all my friends being like, hey, have you had a bad day at work? Because I can promise you I can beat whatever <laughs> has happened. Whatever has happened at work, I promise you I've beaten it. So what did you do? Um, we tried to get, we tried, we tried to get a flight that night. There was no flights. We could have driven to Atlanta to get a flight from Atlanta, but it was like too hard. And it was, it was just, we just went, you know what? We just stay the night here and we'll fly out tomorrow morning um, to get to Columbus. So yeah, it was just, it definitely didn't help us that week. I got sick because it was like I hardly slept that night. And you know, just you go through four airports or whatever, you just bound to pick right. up something and like. Yeah, it was just, it was not a, not a good week after that. But it was like, it's, uh, it's still one of the funniest stories ever, I think. And it was, it was amazing. Like, once it got out on social media and stuff, right. the amount of people that went, you know what? I've done the same thing. Like, there was other people oh, yeah. that went, I went to rally in South Carolina, not North Carolina. Or like, someone flew, someone booked a flight to Dublin, um, Ireland rather than Dublin, Ohio. Or like, oh. the amount of stories that came out of like, right. people, people messing up travel plans that was like anyone who kind of gave me stick about it. I was like, can you not see everyone else has done the same thing? Like we travel every single week. Like it was bound to happen at some point. So yeah. So I'm guessing now when you book travel, you double check where you're going. Yeah. I I don't book travel anymore. My my agent's taking that job off me. (laughs) It's probably a good thing. Cause now if it happens, you can blame somebody else for it. Yeah, we did. First event of the year. We uh, was obviously in Napa. I flew into Sacramento. My, I put up, uh, I, I Google search, how many Sacramento's are there in America? Could I be flying <laughs> the wrong one? That's so funny. But you're right. There are a lot of states with the same names. I mean, there's Jacksonville's all over the country. There's oh. Springfield's, there's Columbus's, there's, I mean, like, I mean, there's, there, there's two Miami's. I mean, really? There should be one Miami in the U.S. We have two. Correct. So, yeah. no, I, I completely understand what happened. Um, I know you said you've struggled to get your coach over from Australia. Who, who is your coach? Dom as a party is my coach. Um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to hit him up, Skillist is his uh, is his platform now. If you hit him up on Skillist, it's a online app where you can send your swing in, um, yeah. have like a video sort of review done on it. Uh, he's pretty big on there, trying to trying to boost his following. So yeah, if you, uh, he, he's really. I mean, for people out there, I, I know there's a lot of nuts out there that want to go through YouTube and look at every video and every swing lesson and tips and everything like that. Dom's Dom obviously knows all that stuff, but he's going to make things very, very simple for you. We don't, we really don't talk a lot about technique. It's, it's what are you working on right now? Um, so weirdly, weirdly in a goal swing, you wouldn't teach lateral movement, but I'm actually trying to get more lateral movement on the way back. Oh, Uh, really? Yeah. I've almost gotten, I've gone too far the other way. Like, I've tried to I've tried to really like turn too hard around myself and it's it's not helped at all. It's just not well for me it doesn't help. There's a lot of people that it would it would be really good for, but yeah, like I've so always you're been almost two left on your backswing. Yeah. I, I'm someone that's always been a little bit lateral going back and, and going through and um just not doing that has been has been hurting me, which interestingly enough is like I hate feeling like I move laterally, but it's something I have to do. So yeah, it's that's what I've been struggling with lately. Wow. Before we let you go, I want to run, run through a couple quick questions, like just rapid fire questions. You just answer as quick as you can. Let's see what you do. Hit me. You, you've got free time for eight hours. What are you doing? Um, okay. Uh, where am I? Uh, at home. At home? Okay. So yeah. I've got a GTR, so I'm probably just going to drive that around for eight hours straight. <laughs> Best shot you've ever hit in your life. Uh, the playoff in Dubai, I hit, I hit it in the water, and then I had a wedge shot from, it's like seventy yards. I hit that to like a tap in. That was probably, I mean, I was done from the tournament, and then I wasn't. So that's probably the best shot I ever hit. 
You're uh, on an airplane at an airport and you're streaming, you're binge streaming something on Netflix. What are you watching? Um, I've been, I'm not a big Netflix. So I actually go on YouTube a lot more because there's just more options, but um, anything crime, anything true crime is really good for me. I, I really liked, um, was it Money Heist? The, have you, I don't know whether you've seen Money Heist. It's like I a, haven't seen that, no. It's like a, it was like a Spanish kind of show where they, they robbed the Royal Mint. And it, was, it was actually pretty cool. I watched that for a fair while. Uh, you win the Masters. What's on your Masters Champions dinner the next year? What's on your menu? Oh, okay. So big one in Australia is a chicken parmigiana. And it's like they have it everywhere else in the world, but it's just not the same as they do it in Australia. So like it's just chicken parmigiana. Um, and then I think you'd have to do steaks on the side as well. Uh, dessert could be anything. I'm the biggest sweet tooth ever. So like uh, eating chocolate, anything like just Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with anything for dessert. All right, what's your uh, social media platform of choice? You got Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and, and now TikTok seems to be the hot thing. Uh, definitely Instagram. I'm really pushing back hard on ever getting TikTok. Uh, even though I watch a bunch of reels, my girlfriend gets into me because she's like, you're basically just watching TikToks, but I'm still not on TikTok, so um, that to me counts. Yeah, so if you're going to be, if you're on Instagram, you should follow him. You'll see his, uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, his, uh, he's on the screen, or if you're uh, just listening to it, it's at uh herbs and spices that's h-e-r-b-z the letter n s-p-i-c-e-s underscore herbs and spices underscore well lucas thank you for your time man as far as moving forward where will we see you on the tour where can we see you play next uh i'm gonna play bermuda and mayakoba the next two events uh for me i'm not gonna get any of these three coming up uh here in i think it's two in vegas one in in japan i'm not gonna not gonna play any of those three uh and then i've We'll probably play the Tour Championship in Dubai um, late November, and that should be me done for the season. So, yeah, there's the schedule. Good deal. Well, good luck to you. Thank you for your time, man. And let me ask you a question. Did I let you down? Did I ask you any boring, stupid questions? No, you were good. I was happy with uh, happy with that platform. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you so much, man. Really appreciate it. And good luck to you moving forward. Cheers, Froggy. Thanks for having me on.